to welcome everybody uh, to our speaker series event. As you know, uh, periodically the chairman from his office has these types of events, leadership speaker series, where we bring uh, somebody in to speak on the topic of leadership, uh, accountability, how to achieve great things. And today is one of those days. We have a gentleman here, Commander Kirk Liphold, to speak with us. He's going to be speaking for about 45 minutes, then he'll take question and answers. And his topic is leadership and accountability when it matters. And what he's going to talk about is dealing with difficult situations. How do you manage difficult situations, whether you have direct reports or not, whether you're in a position of leadership or not? How do you come out of those situations and still achieve great things? We're very honored to have him because his background, as you know from the invite, uh, in 2000, in October, he was the commanding officer of the USS Cole, uh, which came under terrorist attack while in port at Yemen. And he is credited, he and his crew are credited for making sure uh, that the ship, did not, the ship did not sink. So we're very honored. He has uh, quite an experience in leadership and overcoming adverse circumstances. Uh, the chairman will speak at the very end of the event. We'll also have question and answers after uh, the commander speaks. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Commander Kurt Lippold. Thank you very much, Mike. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for the honor and privilege of being able to address you today. Um, first thing I would like to do, though, before I begin my formal remarks is to really thank each and every one of you sitting here today and for those out at your remote facilities. And really, that's because while I may have been blessed with a great crew on the morning of October 12, 2000, when USS Cole was attacked by Al-Qaeda terrorists, I also know that the crew and I could not have done what we did that morning and in the 17 days that followed if it really weren't for the thoughts, the support, and the prayers of each and every one of you that were back here on the home front. Because you not only sustained us, but more importantly, you sustained those families that were back here stateside as they waited and wondered. Had their loved ones survived? Had they been wounded? Or had they paid the ultimate price that keeps our nation free? So on behalf of those sailors that are out there today, those young men and women around the globe that have chosen a life of consequence and service to our nation, but also my crew, thank you for what you do on the home front. Now, I had the privilege of sitting at lunch with some of the folks from the maritime branch, but uh, they operate with a little different language than a lot of others. So I want to make sure that we have a common set of understanding with terms so if we could put that shot of the ship back up there. I'm going to show you a very unique thing. Being a typical sailor, we have to have a common understanding of terms. Also being a typical sailor, when you look at a ship, we're going to start the afternoon off with a four-letter word. So when you look at USS Cole, the left side is called the port side, the right side is the starboard side, and then we're going to get a little technical. The pointy end at the front is the bow, the blunt end at the back is the stern, and then let's take it up a notch as well. Floors we call decks, ceilings are overheads, walls are bulkheads, hallways are passageways, but I promise not to use the term of warships as I'm going through the presentation today. I was very blessed by my Navy and my nation to stand at the very back end of USS Cole, crew in their dress uniforms, friends and family in front of me, where I got to say the three greatest words of a naval officer's career. I relieve you. Three simple words, and I assume total accountability for that $1 billion national asset and the lives of almost 300 of our nation's finest sailors. USS Cole was part of the George Washington Aircraft Carrier Battle Group. We had about one year to get the ship ready for deployment. When I took command, though, I knew that I needed to find a way to convey to my crew how we were going to run that ship and what our standards of performance were going to be. I'd like to take just a few minutes and cover those. I call them my pillars of leadership, but what they really did was start the crew to begin their own individual building of their foundations of leadership that 15 months later would define how we were able to save our ship and save our shipmates. So when I look at it right here, there we go. I always like to start out with that first word, integrity. What does that word really mean? Well, now, a lot of people will tell you, well, that's easy. Integrity is just doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason, even if no one is looking. I'm going to raise the bar. I like to define integrity not in those ethical terms, but rather doing all those ethical things regardless of the consequences. 
Because let's face it, it's when people go to make those difficult personal or professional decisions and they suddenly realize what the consequences are going to be, that they unfortunately find reason to take that bright line of integrity and bend it, gray it, or worse yet, lower it. We can't afford to do that in our business because let's face it, lives are at stake. We are in a business where we want to make sure that people can continue to travel and do things around our nation safely. It's the same in the Navy. The next one I wanted to look at, I knew where the ship was, I knew where we needed to be in a year, I had a vision for how we were gonna make USS Cold Combat capable and ready to deploy. What's that vision worth? Nothing, until I took the time and invested it to make sure that my crew understood what the vision was, but more importantly, how each and every sailor, from the lowest seaman recruit all the way up to my number two, the executive officer, were gonna to contribute to making it a reality. Because once they understood what the vision was and how they're going to make it happen, they took ownership of it. And you know as well as I do, when people take ownership of a vision, there's virtually nothing that can stop them from achieving it. The next thing I wanted to take a look at was right there. We'll go back up one. Just personal accountability and responsibility. When you look at that word, a lot of people will sit down today and not realize a very simple thing that I wanted my sailors to understand. There's only one person in your life that is responsible for the decisions you make and the consequences that come from it, and that's you as an individual. You can have laws, you can have rules, you can have regulations, you can have policies. Let's face it, for the guys sitting out there, we only need to know two words, right? Yes, dear. But at the end of the day, when we say those words, who made the decision? We did. Who lives with the consequences? We do. Each individual is responsible for your personal decisions. When those sailors began to realize that that was their responsibility, what they also began to notice was that their shipmates to their left and their right had their back, they had theirs, and then it fostered the kind of teamwork that everyone likes to see. Now, when you look at the next bullet there, personally, I have never liked the word empower. Too many times during my career, I would run into officers senior to me that would tell me they wanted to empower me to do something. But what do I really hear them saying? I want you to do something I don't want to do, and if you don't get it right, I'm going to hold you accountable. That is not empowering people. That's shifting responsibility down the chain of command. When you're in a leadership position, which all of you are at one point or another, what you're really doing is you're trying to create a bubble around the people that work for you to give them an opportunity where you're going to trust and invest in them to go out there and take initiative, to innovate, get out there and do those things that lead to success. But guess what else you're going to do as leaders? You're going to assume another dirty four-letter word called risk, and you're going to give them occasionally that opportunity to fail. Unless they're bending metal, endangering lives, or losing a ton of money, guess what? Who were the first people in our lives that gave us an opportunity to fail when our parents told us, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that? And I'm sure that every single person out there listening today, we were all smarter than our parents at one point in our life. And what did we do? We did exactly what they told us not to do, faced first into the bulkhead, picked ourselves up by our bootstraps, realized we'd made a mistake, and guess what we did? We created a reference point that now served for the path of success that put you here today listening to me. That's what you do when you trust and invest in the people that work for you. The next one I'd look at is that you have to know your job. You have to be professionally competent. What does that really mean? That means that when someone comes to work, whether it's here at the NTSB or a sailor walking up my brow to co report aboard USS Cole, I wanted to give them five things. First and foremost, tell them what their job is and be specific. Yes, I know we all deal with PDs out there, but guess what? Position descriptions. But guess what? At the end, I know that HR is always going to want you to let it go away with that last bullet that says, and other duties as assigned. Avoid that one like, like the plague. Because at the end of the day, when people know what the job is, guess what the next step is? Tell them how well you want it done. What is the standard of performance you expect from them? But then as leaders, you give them the training, the tools and resources, and the time to do that job right. If someone makes a mistake before you call them in for that infamous counseling session, invest in yourself for a few minutes and take a step back and ask yourself, did that individual understand what their job was, how well I wanted it done, and did I provide them with the training tools and time to do that job right? If not, do a little calibration, call them in, discuss it, and then guess what you're gonna do? Create the reference point for both of you that is gonna lead to better success. 
So with all these things put together, one year later, USS Cole is ready to deploy. When we got underway from Norfolk, the way the crew does it is they get into their dress uniforms and they stand at parade rest. Down on the pier, friends and family tearfully waving goodbye to their loved ones. As we pulled away from the pier in Norfolk, headed to the Middle East, and out into the Elizabeth River, then the Chesapeake Bay and the Atlantic, we achieved something then that had never been done before and has never been repeated since on a Navy ship. As we got our ship underway for deployment, every single one of my officers manned the rail. Who got that ship underway? A 100% qualified enlisted crew. Now, if you think they were happy, proud, and pleased about that achievement, they weren't. They kind of looked at it and said, ah, it's nice, the captain's got a nice check in the block for him to get promoted, but in the meantime, I've missed my kids' soccer games, ballet recitals, I didn't get the honeydew list done at home, I didn't get quality time with the family, on duty nights I'm not spending it, catching my breath after a long day working, but I'm tracing systems. But what that would give them was two months later when we were attacked, and almost 20% of the crew was killed and injured. They now had the confidence, not only from a system standpoint, but more importantly, a leadership standpoint, to step up into those now vacant positions when they showed up at their general quarter station to do what was necessary to save our ship and shipmates. So we left, sailed across the Atlantic, pulled into the Mediterranean. Our mission that we had trained for for the past year was actually to pass through the Mediterranean, then go to the North Arabian Gulf and enforce United Nations sanctions that had been put in place as a result of the first Gulf War in the early 1990s. But as we pulled into the Mediterranean, unfortunately we then had to suffer for four miserable long weeks. We had to suffer through Barcelona, Spain, Villafranche, France, Valletta, Malta, Copper, Slovenia. Hey, tagline still works. Join the Navy, see the world, and they did exactly that. Okay, they saw bullfights, they saw the Louvre, they saw the Eiffel Tower, they went up and over the border. <laughs> little gambling at the Casino di Monte Carlo. We get underway from Malta, hold ships underway because nobody hit the big one. St. Paul Shipwreck Cathedral, up to Copper, Slovenia. Passport bus ride two and a half hours later, they're taking gondola rides and walking around St. Mark's Square seeing some of the beautiful glasswork in Naples, Italy, or excuse me, in Venice, Italy. So that was the reality. But that's not our real mission. Our real mission is to head to the Middle East. So we would sit there, leave Copper, Slovenia, come down the Adriatic, do what they call an underway replenishment alongside of an oiler. Then we would race across the Eastern Mediterranean through the Suez Canal on the 9th of October, down the Red Sea again at about 25 knots, around 30 miles an hour, through the Strait of Bab al-Mandeb, rounded the corner at two o'clock in the morning off, the, off this port called Aden, Yemen. Now, a lot of people have asked me over time, why Aden, Yemen? Why are we even having to refuel? Why are we even having to go into a port? Well, we pulled into those ports specifically because geographically, they're at the halfway point between the Mediterranean and the Arabian Gulf and the Arabian Sea. They sit astride some of the most strategic sea lanes in the world. And if you also look, they are astride those strategic sea lanes. We would pull in that morning because we'd gone from a Navy of 4,000 ships in World War II to a Navy of 600 ships at the height of the Reagan buildup in the mid-1980s. So that morning we were down to 315 ships. There was only one oiler in the Middle East and it wasn't within a thousand miles. And today we're down, down to around 280 ships. So early that morning we would pull into the port of Aden, Yemen. Two tugs would meet us, make a series of right hand turns. We would get into the middle of the port. Then I made my first force protection decision, turned the ship around, moored it starboard side to appear out in the middle of the harbor. We would shut down the four engines that powered the two shafts we would leave two of our three gas turbine generators running to provide power to the ship. Then we began the import refueling checklist. I was in my cabin at 10 o'clock that morning when I get a knock on the door. It's my main propulsion assistant. Now the way the ship is designed organizationally, you have a commanding officer, an executive officer, then a series of department heads, operations, combat systems, weapons, supply, engineer. Under that engineer, she has an electrical officer, an auxiliaries officer, a damage control assistant, and that main propulsion assistant or MPA. That's the individual responsible for those engines, those generators, and all the fuel and lubricants on board the ship. He walks in with the import refueling checklist. Says, Captain, checklist is complete, valves are properly aligned, the chief engineer is down doing her checks below, but if you would do me a favor and just skip to the bottom, bottom line it right now, I will go wait for the chief engineer in the central control station, which is like the nerve center for the engineering plant, and as soon as she's done, we can sign off and start refueling that much quicker. Now, why did we want to speed that process up? Ship like USS Cole carries a little over a half million gallons of fuel. 
Because of the race across the eastern Mediterranean and down the Red Sea, we were below 50%, excuse me, below 50% fuel. That meant we'd be taking on over a quarter million gallons. I'd been in touch with a commanding officer who'd been in there previously. He said, you can expect a refueling rate of around three to 500 gallons a minute. You can do the quick math. We're gonna be there at least six to eight hours refueling the ship. The sooner I get started, the sooner I can get underway. I wanted to be underway during daylight hours. So that's what it was gonna take so long. That's why he wanted to speed the process up. But what did he just ask me to do? Violate procedures. Okay, there is a process and there are procedures in place for a reason. First and foremost, safety. That's why we follow those. Now this is a young, talented officer. He had started out as that fireman recruit in the Navy, promoted up through the enlisted ranks to E7 chief petty officer, wanted a bigger challenge and become an officer. 13 years of experience in the Navy. A great mentor to my young junior officers learning about leadership and management for the first time in their careers, if not their lives. So I look at him and I said, MPA, you know as well as I do, when we refuel the ship, we do it by the book. Take the checklist down, wait for the chief engineer, and when she's done with her checks, valves are properly aligned, bring it back up and I'll sign off on it. Of course, being a good prior enlisted sailor, as he grabs the checklist and is walking out of my cabin, he's expressing his complete and total satisfaction with my logic, which I will not repeat. Unfortunately, it was the last time I'd see Drew alive. 10.30. Chief engineer comes up, captain, the checklist is complete, valves are properly aligned, crest mission to refuel USS Cole, double checked it, signed off, and a few minutes later we started pumping fuel. The clock started. 1040, supply officer comes in. Captain, when we pulled into the port, we made a very generous offer. For $150, the logistics agent was gonna do three things. Could you bring the picture back up? When we refuel the ship, that was number one. Two, bring out a sewage barge, which was tied off back by the flight deck, so that when we were pumping fuel, we couldn't keep all the sewage on board, we could pump it into the barge instead of the harbor water, and then take fresh water from the pier so we didn't have to make fresh water out of the dirty harbor. But he also made a very generous offer. For $150 and no questions asked, they would send three garbage barges out to us to take off all the trash, all the plastics, and the hazmat that we can't dump at sea. I looked at her and said, wow, that is a good deal. No. She gives me a slightly exasperated look and I said, we're not overflowing on any of those things. In four days, we're gonna pull into Bahrain and Fifth Fleet headquarters. We can get rid of all that stuff for free before we go to the North Arabian Gulf. We'll wait. Of course, like the MPA, supply officer as she's walking out is profusely thanking me for my leadership and guidance and helping to execute her fiduciary responsibilities. Does she give up? No, 10 minutes later. Knock on the door, now she comes in with reinforcements. She's got the executive officer with her. Let's play it, the logic train. Cam, think about it. We're a billion dollar ship with a multi-million dollar budget. We're 12 days into the fiscal year. I guarantee you will find $150 worth of budget efficiencies in the next 353 days. I didn't want to pitch the fight, looked at the supply officer, said fine, go make it happen. She grins from ear to ear because believe it or not, sometimes despite what you tell your folks, they're gonna do the right thing. Two barges had crossed, one had tied off at the middle of the ship, one back by the flight deck. The crew had brought up all the trash, all the plastic, all the hazmat. We're patiently waiting for the captain to get his act together. Supply officer walked out, gave a thumbs up, and they began to put everything into the boat so everything's on track. But at that point, the XO on his way up to see me had stopped into the central control station. How are we doing? We're doing great now that we've got things settled out a little bit. What do you mean? When they initially opened the valve up down on the pier and fuel began to flow onto the ship, instead of three to 500 gallons a minute, the initial rate coming on board USS Cole was 2,500 gallons per minute. It was coming on so fast that we were overpressurizing the fuel tanks, the alarms were going off, we had to holler at the Yemeni fuel workers down on the pier to tighten the valve and bring that rate down to 2,000 gallons a minute. But at that rate, I could fill the big centerline tanks, I could fill the wing tanks, but instead of being there six to eight hours, I'd be there two to two and a half. We were ready to feed the noon meal, chicken fajitas. Supply officer said we're ready to go. What would that mean? That meant that we could circle, cycle the crew through and about the time that they would finish eating would be about the time that we'd finish refueling and I could get USS Cole underway and out of port safely and back out to see where we felt better. So I said, go tell the crew we're ahead of schedule. Turn back to my desk, doing routine paperwork that we all love to do every day. The EXO makes the announcement in the background when at 11.18 in the morning, there was a 
thunderous explosion. You could feel all 505 feet and 8,400 tons of guided missile destroyer suddenly and violently thrust up into the right. The ship bowed in the middle. The shock wave reflected off the seabed about 36 feet deep, hit the underside by the keel and lifted us up that estimated six to eight feet. And as we were twisting and flexing and sliding back down in the water, lights failed. Ceiling tiles popped out. I came into the brace position, grabbing the underside of my desk and the balls of my feet as everything popped up and slammed back down. When the ship stopped moving and rocking side to side to a point that I could let go of my desk, I walked over to the door of my cabin. As I stood there in the door in the dark and looked down, there's one emergency light in the door, one halfway down the passageway, and at the far end, a gray cloud comes around the corner, rolls toward me, and silently washes over me. I could smell the dust. I could smell the fuel. But there was also this acrid metallic tang that settled in the back of my mouth, and I didn't know what it was. A young officer living in the stateroom behind mine comes out, grabs the door jam, looks at me wide-eyed and using good sailor-like language, asks me, what the F was that? Then he goes, fuel. Thinking like everyone else, we've had a major fuel explosion. And what does he do? Without saying another word, he takes off into that gray cloud, headed toward the danger to find out what's happened. I took one step out of my cabin to follow him and stopped. To this day, I can't explain it, but it was like the lens that I viewed the world through slammed wide open. I was now taking in huge amounts of information. And when I pulled USS Cole into port, moored her starboard side to that pier, if it had been a fuel explosion on the ship of the pier being next to a stationary object, I should have been blown left, but I'd been thrust up and to the right. The only thing I can see in that left side of that picture is open harbor water, so instinctively something has come alongside and exploded. I went back into my cabin, back into the bedroom area, and near the head of my bed was the safe where I kept the keys to the weapon systems. Missiles, torpedoes, guns. I bend down on one knee, dialed it open, reached in, don't grab a handful of keys. Instead, I pulled out a nine millimeter pistol, loaded it, chambered it around, decopped it. Grabbed two clips of ammunition, put them in my pocket, took a deep breath, out of my cabin, down one deck, and ran to the middle of the ship. When I get to the middle, I'm in a semi-enclosed area called the break, and I'm looking back toward the flight deck, and no one is around. The three-person watch team that used to be there, gone. Their wooden podium were kept the, kept the deck log, about the size of this podium here, has been blown in pieces and is scattered across the deck. Wires that used to form a high-frequency radio antenna are snapped off and draped down, and dirty black water is dripping off of everything. I don't know if we're going to be boarded. I don't know if there's going to be a follow-on attack. All I know is I need to get to the port side and find out what's going, on, what's going on. So what do I do standing there with that non-millimeter? Take a deep breath. It might be my destiny, but all I can think to myself is if you head toward the port side and you see someone that doesn't belong, you make them duck first and don't leave an empty round in the chamber. Took that deep breath, headed over to the port side, and the first person I see is not a terrorist. It is my chief gunner's mate responding with the security teams, reestablishing the defensive perimeter around the ship. We walk over to the port side of the ship, leaned over, and now for the first time you could see the hole in the side confirming my worst fears. Everything external to the ship by that explosive hole is shoved inward, meaning it was an external explosion. You can see the spray pattern of explosive residue. You can see the snapped off thrive lines. And as I glanced over the side, I also see four orange rafts. One sunk in the blast hole, two more deflated lying alongside the ship, and one fully inflated raft back by the flight deck. First thing that went through my mind was, how did someone let these rafts get alongside the ship? Clearly, something had allowed them to get alongside. But at the same time, as I look back toward the flight deck, all these sailors are coming out from inside of the ship. What are they doing? They're walking right over to the port side, leaning over, trying to see what's happening. What do I see them doing? They're exposing the upper half of their bodies to an explosives-laden raft that, if it goes off, is going to kill them. Because the first raft was flattened out sunk in the blast hole. The next two were deflated, lying alongside the ship, probably peppered with shrapnel and the detonators walked loose. But that one by the flight deck, it's fully inflated, and if it goes off, it's instantly going to kill them. So I told the chief, unless they're part of your security teams, get everyone back inside the skin of the ship. They rounded everyone up and came back in. Once they did that, though, one of the security team members came running up to me and said, Captain, Captain, so those rafts, so that isn't, that, they're not the threat. The two garbage barges had come alongside. They had left and the third boat came out, turned by the bow, came down the side of the ship, right to the middle of the ship where the other garbage barge had been. So that's what blew up. What did we experience? 
something the intelligence community had never anticipated and we had never trained for, a waterborne improvised explosive device with two suicide bombers that when it detonated, those rafts in the water were actually our rafts that were in big gray fiberglass containers that the concussion of the explosion had blown them out and had landed. So what was a threat was now in little pieces over the top side of USS Cole. I said, go get a grappling hook, get those rafts on board. I don't want anything distracting the security teams. But at this point in time, I knew the ship was going to be in trouble and my timeline jumped out one hour. Why? Even though I had not seen any wounded, I knew we were within the golden hour and we needed to get help out to the ship to get the wounded off and ashore. So I would leave, I would go up to the bridge, and at this point in time when I arrive up there, there's my operations officer and navigator. What do we have? Sir, no power, no ability to communicate. Over by my chair is a handheld bridge to ridge walkie talkie. The navigator went over, grabbed it. I dialed it into channel 16, contacted the Yemeni Port Authority and asked them for three things. First, freeze all harbor movements since we didn't know where the attack had come from. Two, notify local hospitals. They said they had, would, had two and would get ambulances down to the pier. And three was send boats out to help get the wounded off the ship. But I also put a condition on them. I said, when those boats come out, I want them to make an arc around the stern of the ship, come to the back of the refueling pier, and we will get the wounded down to you. But I also made another provision. I said, when those boats come out, they must not come any closer than 100 meters to my port side, or I will shoot you. Do you understand? And while the Yemeni Port Authority said, yes, yes, we understand, when those boats started coming out, I observed a very unique phenomenon. I don't care where you are in the world. When you tell someone something like that, you will find there is no problem with the English language. Those boats stayed probably 300 meters away from us. They made a huge slow walk around the strip, very gingerly came to the back of the refueling pier. We had to get used to boats coming out to us that no longer represented a threat. By the same token, the Yemenis had to get used to a very angry, very agitated crew that had broken out every crew served weapon, locked, loaded, and pointed at them with the safeties off. 50 caliber machine guns, M60 machine guns, M79 grenade launchers, M14s, 12 gauge shotguns, nine millimeter pistols, and if they'd come inside the 100 meter arc, wrenches, hammers, screwdrivers, you name it, we were gonna do whatever it took to defend the ship. But at that point in time, USS Cole is in trouble. We are listing over five and a half degrees to port, down one degree by the bow. We could literally feel our ship sinking beneath our feet. At that point, I left the operations officer in charge, went down two decks in the dark to my cabin, grabbed a flashlight, down two more decks, and started walking toward the back end of USS Cole on the starboard or right side. As I start walking toward the back end, though, I get my first piece of good news. The back one-third of the ship has lights on. So right then and there, if I've got lights on, that means I got power to pumps, which means I can save the ship. With that generator running, I walked toward and got to the middle passageway. Near that passageway is one of the three lockers where we keep all the damage control for the ship. It is the widest portion of the ship at 66 feet. The blast wave has pushed all the way across and has crushed that repair locker shut. So I'm down one third on damage control. That middle passageway also serves as the mess line where I feed the crew. So guess what? I would go over there, look down. This is what the mess line would normally look like. And you can see where the grilled trays are, where the crew would pick up their trays, slide them along, get their chicken fajitas, their refried beans, their rice and dessert. When they get to the end, they'd hook a U-turn to the left, walk into the mess decks, get something to drink, and then sit at the tables to eat their lives. But as I rounded the corner, what do I see? Literally, it's a wall of metal shoved toward the starboard side. So what ends up happening, I don't think I can walk down the passageway. I back out, walk through a door, and I'm standing out, standing out in front of my main medical treatment area. I open the door and walk in. It's in the dark, and none of my medical personnel around. Not my chief hospital corpsman who'd like a physician's assistant, not the third-class hospital corpsman, nor the young deck seaman that was learning to be a hospital corpsman. But there's a great design on the ship. If you walk through the medical treatment area, there's a two bed sick bay and then the back doors open onto the mess decks. The reason we did that is the mess decks is actually my mass casualty area. Each of the tables are the perfect width and length to take a wounded saint or pick them up and set them on those tables to do triage to save their lives. But as I walk out, the mess decks in the dark, only a few emergency lights shining and all I see are shattered glass, shattered plates, knives, forks, spoons, trays, food scattered everywhere and nothing around. 
okay, I'm down one third on damage control. I have no medical, I have no medical personnel, I have no mass casualty area, and I still haven't seen the full extent of the damage. So I crunch, slip, slide, walk across the mess decks. When I get over there, this is the port side looking forward toward the bow. Just on the other side of that door to the right is the mess line I just show you. What did I see instead? It's a wall of metal. Just beyond that door, that deck is folded up at a 60 degree angle, completely cutting off the left side of the ship. What I didn't know at that time is when the blast hit and projected into main engine room number one, what used to be the overhead in main engine room number one was the deck in the mess line and galley area that had ripped into four large chunks. One peeled up and to the left, cutting off the left side of the ship that you see here. One peeled and slammed forward into the chief petty officer's mess, that mid-level layer of leadership and management. One peeled back into the mess line, crushing and trapping sailors in the wreckage. Then the other piece acted like a giant scoop, tearing along all the way over to the starboard side that had jammed the repair locker shut. Now I know I've got to get to the central control station and find out what's going on. Back into the darkened mess decks. When I get there, though, headed out toward the back end, I see light coming from up near the galley area. Maybe I can see how bad the damage is. So I walk up, walk up to the galley area, standing in this spot, this is what the galley would normally look like. Clean, stainless steel, and beautiful. What do I see instead? That's the interior of USS Cole completely blown apart. From where this picture is taken, it's where I stood. If I turn and take two steps to the left, I'm now at that waist high piece of metal looking down into what's left of main engine room number one. From the side of the ship into that point is over 20 feet and it is just a large cavern. I can see the hole in the side. I can see the sunlight shining in. I can hear water from Maiden Harbor lapping down in what's left of the engine room and I can smell fuel and lots of it. We estimate that the Yemenis kept pumping fuel on the ship at that 2,000 gallon per minute rate for at least five to seven minutes after the blast before they finally got their wherewithal and shut the valve down on the pier. But coupled with the cracked fuel tanks over the next few days, we would leak well over 60,000 gallons of fuel into Aden Harbor. Now my apologies right up front. We as a nation have made the decision to go green, but I'm sorry, in that particular moment, I did not pause to fill out the EPA spill report. There's just some things you gotta let go at a time like this. But it's not what I smell that worries me, it's now what I see in here. I'm seeing flashes reflecting off the side of the ship and down in all that fuel, we have not electrically isolated that part of the ship yet and I'm now hearing It's live electrical wires dipping in and out of that fuel and I'm thinking to myself, not only have we suffered a devastating explosion, now I'm gonna have a major fire on my hands. So I back out of the galley area, walk through the mess deck, step out, I'm in the lighted portion of the ship, walk down around the corner, walked up into the central control station, and when I got there, it is a hurricane of activity. To my left, the engineer is working with their engineers. What's the status of the generator? Temperatures, pressures, normal, how many pumps do we have online, and how much spare power do we have? To my right, the executive officer is working with the damage control assistant. Where's the primary damage? Where's the secondary damage? And what are we doing to control the flooding? At that point, that 15 months of training and investment in my crew paid off and allowed me to make the smartest decision of my command tour. I kept my mouth shut. The last thing I needed to do would be to walk in and take charge of a situation that I had no idea what was going on. Instead, I just stood there for a minute before I said, Chief Engineer, XO, and you two are ready. Tell me what we've got. They wrapped up what they were doing, came to me and briefed me on the status of the ship. USS Cole has four main engineering spaces. Up forward is auxiliary machinery room number one, main engine room number one, auxiliary machinery room number two, and main engine room number two. Aux one had number one gas turbine generator that had been running, knocked offline, and couldn't power anything now, couldn't restart it. Main one. That has the long shaft on the starboard side through a reduction gear, runs through the next two engineering spaces and out the back end of the ship. Ox two, the shaft goes through it, pumps and air conditioning units, main engine room number two, that has the starboard shaft going through it as well as two Alpha, two Bravo gas turbine engines powering the short shaft on the port side of the ship through a reduction gear out the back end. Main one bore the brunt of the blast and it flooded immediately. Then we had progressive flooding. Ox 2 had flooded, then the supply office above that. Cracks leaking forward into Ox 1. Cracks leaking aft into Main 2. But also where the shaft came into Main 2, coming out from Main Engine Room Number 1, the seal around that shaft had shattered and water was spraying in at a 20 gallon per minute leak rate. 
Chief Engineer, even though she knew the question, looked at me and asked the point blank question. Captain, are we going to lose the ship? You could have heard a pin drop. Having built one of these ships, though, earlier in my career from the keel up, I knew that, believe it or not, we could sustain more damage than you see here. And I just looked at her matter of factly and said, no, no, if all we've lost are main one and ox two, get the flooding and shoring teams down into ox one and main two, we're going to be fine. Knowing that key piece of information, took the tension level down by an order of magnitude because everyone suddenly realized it was not a matter of if, but how and when we'd now be able to save USS Cole. At that point in time, I turned damage control efforts over to the executive officer. We had established a medical triage area up in the middle of the ship. So I walk up there, more good news. There's my chief hospital corpsman. There's my third class hospital corpsman and the deck seaman. The chief comes up and starts briefing me on the status of the wounded. Already I have one, two, three sailors in metal litters strapped in ready to be evacuated off the ship. He briefs me on all of them, but as I look over at the third one, it's my senior chief gas turbine technician, the senior most enlisted on the ship in the engineering department, the most experienced in damage control. He lifts his head up and motions me over. So I walk over to his litter and I kneel down. He reaches up and he grabs my hand. Says, Captain, I don't think I'm going to make it. And I looked down at him and said, Senior Chief, I don't want to hear that. I want you to think your wife, Lisa, and those two blonde-haired kids of yours who want to see their daddy again. He said, sir, you don't know how badly I'm hurt. In fact, I did. He had just finished eating lunch and was sitting in the lounge area when the blast hit. Because of the dynamics, it blew him out of his chair. He went tumbling 25 feet across the space to the very back end, landed on his back, and was pinned in by debris. He had managed to dig into his pocket, bring out a small little flashlight, unscrewed the top, and was waving it around. When the rescue teams got to him, he's looking up at him on his back, perfectly calm. Says, hey, don't worry about me. I'm just pinned in by the debris, but be careful. There might be body parts around here. The rescue teams don't say a word. They just bend down and start lifting all the debris off of him. When they get down to him, it's not body parts. It's a compound fracture with multiple breaks from the femur on down, and his right leg is folded up across his chest with the boot near his ear. So what do they do? They said, Senior Chief, we gotta get your leg straightened out and get you into a litter to get you evacuated. So they grab his leg and they say, we're gonna straighten it out on the count of three. Ready, one, and they flop it out straight. Typical Navy, ahead of schedule. He gives out a slight yelp, we get him strapped in, we bring him up to the middle of the ship, we started an IV and then gave him a shot of morphine. If you've ever had morphine, you know it doesn't take away pain, it makes it so you don't care about it. So we had a nice morphine haze. How do we get him off the ship? Well, when you look at that picture, you can see the gangplank going down to the pier. That was not there initially. We were only there for a brief stop for fuel, not a port visit, so that brow's not down. Now they're horsing around that 300 pounds of aluminum to try and get it bolted into place, but my clock's ticking. Down on the pier's a wooden extension ladder. The Yemenis extended out, leaned it up against the side of the ship. We would drag the litters over to the port side, tie two lines to the feet and throw it to the workers, two lines to the head, three sailors on each one, and then here you go, risk management on the fly push the litter over the side, vertical, down onto the ladder, then wiggling back and forth down onto the pier where they'd untie the lines, run them over, and put it into the boats. It's only been 30 minutes since the blast hit. My navigator came down from the bridge and is standing in front of me. She would volunteer to go ashore, track the wounded between the two hospitals. That evening, the French, who had heard about their blast, would fly a medical evacuation plane into Aden. They would take 11 of my most seriously wounded sailors, and they would leave and fly them to Djibouti for treatment. The next day, two aircraft would fly in from uh, Germany. They would take all the sailors in Aden, all the sailors in Djibouti, and initially back to Landstuhl, Germany, and then back stateside for treatment. My navigator had walked off that ship wearing only the clothes on her back, goes into a foreign country, gets an aircraft from another country, flies to a third country, and had never questioned what she was doing. As a testament to how well the crew did that first day, we would evacuate 33 wounded off the ship in 99 minutes, and of those 33, 32 survived, so would have survived, did survive. My navigator could have left with the Air Force on that medevac aircraft. What did she do instead? Two days later, flies back to Aden, makes her way from the airport, checks in with the admiral standing up the joint task force, comes down to the pier, gets on a Yemeni boat, sails across the harbor, walks across the refueling pier, up the brow, and reports back aboard for duty. That's a level of dedication that I had. In the meantime, now at the one hour point back on the ship, the defense attache, an army lieutenant colonel, is standing down on the pier. He said, 
have you told anyone in Fifth Fleet of the chain, chain of command what's happened? I said, no, we have no power in the forward two thirds of the ship, no ability to communicate. He said, well, I've got a cell phone here. It's GSM capable. Do you want to make the call? It has the number to the Fifth Fleet Operations Center. I said, sure, toss it up. So he looks at me, backs up, looks, one, looks at me one more time, takes that phone and tosses it. And as I'm watching it tumble through the air headed toward me, all I could think to myself was, okay, Lippold, when you were in high school at the Naval Academy, your two favorite sports were tennis and golf. If the, come on, you gotta give me a little bit here. Guess what? It was a perfect toss. I cup it, catch it, dating myself a little bit, flipped it open, saw the number to the Fifth Fleet Operations Center and hit the send button. A few seconds later, I get ring, 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 ring. Fifth Fleet Command Center, duty officer speaking, may I help you? I said, yes, this is commanding officer USS Cole, Kirk Lippold, I have an Op Rep 3, Pinnacle, front burner report. Translating that, Op Rep 3 is the operational report anytime a Navy ship has a major emergency like this, fire, flooding, explosion. Pinnacle means that whatever I'm gonna tell that duty officer is now gonna generate national level press interest. Front burner, that's code for attack on US forces. So when I tell the duty officer I have an Op Rep 3, Pinnacle, front burner report, first thing I get on the end of that phone is silence, then the duty officer gets to ask his question. Are you sure? <laughs> yes, this is an Op Rep 3 Pinnacle front burner. I mean, I've seen the hole, I'm standing amongst the wounded. This isn't rocket science. That would kick off a message a few minutes later called a critical incident report message notifying the world that a Navy ship in the port of Aden, Yemen had been attacked by terrorists and needed help. I might be the most modern 21st century destroyer afloat, but guess what? I'm using tried and true techniques from World War II. Remember that shaft seal I talked about coming into main engine room number two? Well, guess what? These are the modern 21st century wooden wedges and this waxy rope substance called oakum pounded in around that shaft to take a 20 gallon per minute leak rate down to a few drips per minute. I didn't have power to spare to circulate air or cool it down. So unless you were standing a watch, you were out there trying to keep the ship afloat stop another attack or get a little bit of shut eye. This picture was taken the first morning after the blast. So what would happen is we would be there for the next few days trying to restore systems around the ship. We would almost lose, or we did lose our only operating generator Sunday morning at about 3.30 in the morning because of fuel starvation. We'd lost the ability to remotely monitor fuel, had accidentally sucked a tank dry, three chances to restart it. We would go through one, two, three shots of high pressure air, and by 7.30 Sunday morning, I'm in the worst condition possible. Hot, dark, quiet, sinking in a foreign port with a hole in my side from a terrorist attack. It was assessed to be so bad, they actually woke President Clinton up at 4.30 in the morning and said the ship's without power and we don't think they can save it. What did we do on the ship? Same thing all of you would do. You don't give up, and neither did my crew. Backed into a corner, God loves sailor ingenuity. One of them, my sailors came to me that morning and said, hey, Captain, you know the air packs that the firefighters wear? What if we were to take the two portable pumps that we can still use, put them on the flight deck, run the hoses down and jury rig the fittings to fit into the flask for number three generator to try and get that high pressure air back? Great idea, go do it. Some total of the conversation we had. When you wanna talk about trust and invest, this is why you do it. When you have your sailors backs, they can do it, phenomenal things. They would jury rig those fittings, start the pumps, run them for about 14 hours, and at five minutes after midnight Monday morning, we had two shots of high pressure air, and on the very first one, we would restart number three generator. We would be in that port for 17 days, but eventually enough is enough. We want to get out of there in the worst kind of way. We've heard of this big heavy lift ship called Blue Marlin that was going to act like a large floating dry dock to pick up the ship and bring us back stateside, but it's 23 miles down the coast. Now I'd been told by all the naval architects that had come aboard the ship was stable and good to, good to go. So I asked the question, well, why don't we just do it right off the port? And they said, well, just in case something goes wrong, we don't want the media to necessarily be filming that. That's why we're gonna go 23 miles down the coast. So it was my response, okay, that means they're not entirely sure. Exo, put the ship back at general quarters, mandate complete silence on the ship. And the reason I did that is I knew the crew would be able to hear if something was going wrong long before they saw a problem developing. Four you many tugs would come out, tie their lines up to us, and gently pull us out into the middle of the harbor. And how did USS Cole do? Rock solid, 
quality American-made workmanship, not so much as either a Greek or a, Greek or a creek or a groan. We had lost our announcing system in the initial blast and the backup system had also failed. We had restored those system over the intervening days. So that was ready to tell the crew what was happening. Didn't have to. Instead, back on the flight deck, we've set up a stereo system. And as the lead tug starts to tow us out of Aden Harbor, I turned to the XO and said, XO, play the first song. And the first song that we played as we were leaving Aden Harbor, Star Spangled Banner. You bet. I wanted our national anthem coming off that ship, echoing across the harbor, to send a signal to the Yemenese people that despite what had happened to us, we were going to leave with our head held high. But as we're getting towed out, if you look in the upper right corner of that picture, as we're getting towed toward it, there's a small pier sticking out with two Yemeni Navy patrol boats. What did the crew member from those boats do as we started coming toward them? They got into their dress uniforms, came down on the pier, turned toward us, and as we went by, came to attention and rendered honors. And what did we do as professionals? We called attention to port and returned those honors to them. Once clear, though, I turned back to the XO and said, play the second song. Second song that we played? Star Spangled Banner again, you bet. Second time though, Jimi Hendrix version. <laughs> so then we're on that long straight stretch. We're headed out of the harbor at that point. Turn to the XO, feeling pretty good as the captain. Lowered my guard ever so slightly. Said, XO, crews earned it. Let them play what they want. I wanted a good cultural signal of American rock and roll coming off the ship. In that moment, however, I would learn my most defining lesson as commanding officer on just how much leash you give a sailor in a moment like this. Because the next thing I hear coming out of the speakers is not music. They have turned the stereo system all the way up. They have turned the announcing system all the way up. The next thing coming out of those speakers is nothing more than vibrating noise. And for the first time in two and a half weeks, I get to lose my cool. I turn to the XO and asked him, XO, what the is that, get that shut off right now. He gets wide-eyed, tears out of the bridge, runs back to the flight deck, doesn't call me up. It's halfway through the song. What took you so long to get back there? Well, sir, as I, as I headed out the port side and down the ladders or the stairs on the port side, they'd been damaged by the blast and I wanted to take my time because you know, sir, safety still is our number one priority. Okay, got it, XO. Do you want me to shut off the song? No. Better volume, better selection, it'd be appreciated. But who had the crew picked? Great American, a guy named Kid Rock. And what was the song? American Badass, all right? Captain, we wanted a cultural signal. Crew, on the other hand, had a slightly different signal. They were, they were subtly, maybe not so subtly, sending to the Yemenese people. Early the next morning, however, we'd be lifted up. We'd be sitting over Blue Marlin, positioned with the lines tying us into place. Then it would slowly begin the process over 12 hours and lift us up and out of the water. The reason we're cocked off at that 17 and a half degree angle is the deepest part of the ship is actually the sonar dome up forward. You can see the rubber dome where we ping and listen for submarines. The blocking docks, which are normally three to four feet high, were about 12 to 15 inches high. And if you look at the back end of the ship, you can actually see where we had to cut two large pits in the deck of Blue Marlin for the propeller blades to slide into with about an inch, inch and a half to spare on either side. Captain of Blue Marlin says, you want to go take a look? I said, sure. He swings a yellow crane with a basket. I get on it, drops me down on the deck. I walk between the two propellers, the two rudders, up the port side. And when I got to the middle, I turned and looked up. And now for the first time, I could see the hole in the side of the ship. Cracks went to within 18 inches of the keel, measured top to bottom and side to side. The hole was 40 by 40 feet. It was as if a giant had taken his fist, punched it in the side of the ship, moved it around, and pulled it back out again. You could see from the cracks all the way down to the fuel tanks at the bottom of the ship, through every level of the engine room, all the way to the overhead of the galley. And just to give you an idea of perspective, that's a guy in a white t-shirt that's sweeping down on deck. Pretty amazing what my crew had accomplished. But as you know, when you have any kind of crisis like this, you don't know what you don't know. When we pulled into Aden that morning, what we didn't know is that this was the view from the safe house window where Al-Qaeda had been for about a year, watching when Navy ships pull in, what pier they went to, what side they moored to, what boats came out, what path they followed. They took advantage of something that they had on their hands then that they have today called time. 
and they will take advantage of it. That's why see something, say something is going to continue to be so critical as we move forward in this era of terrorism. It's not over by a long shot. But the bottom line is, even for all your people, for every single person out there, take the time to invest in yourself and build your own foundation of leadership. You never know when those defining moments are going to come. But when they do, your leadership trusts you. They're giving you an opportunity. You get sent out in the field to go do great work for our nation. Take advantage of having these tools in your kit bag so that when that moment comes, you know exactly what to do, how to do it, and how to do it well for the future of our nation. In closing, though, I'd like to take you back to the first day. When Navy ships are in port, they always hold a ceremony called Colors. Every morning at 8 o'clock, we raise our flag to fly over the ship. In our case, it was a flag staff at the very back end of the ship. Then every evening at sunset, calculated no matter where we are in the world, we lower the flag, fold it, wait till the next morning to raise it again. As we're coming up on sunset that first day, the ship is listing but stable. The wounded are ashore. We know that the French are coming into town. We know that they are sending people down from Fifth Fleet headquarters. The XO and I are standing at the back end of the flight deck. And he looks at me and says, Captain, what do you want to do about colors? Do you want to hold it like we normally do to show they haven't disrupted our routine? Do you want to lower it to half mast to honor the 17 sailors killed, 37 wounded? How do you want to deal with colors, sir? And I remember I looked at my XO. I looked up at the flag all stained with the dirty black residue from the explosion. I looked over at Aiden where the lights were coming on in the twilight. And then I turned back to my XO and I said, XO, we're not going to hold colors. I want that flag to fly at full mast. I want lights rigged to shine up on it as a symbol of our resolve that we're not going to let this terrorist attack deter us from our mission of defending freedom. That flag would fly for the next eight days until the last of my 12 sailors trapped in the wreckage of the mess line, the galley area, and main engine room number one had been located, pried out, identified, and had begun that long journey home to their families. On the ninth day, cots that had been brought on board for the crew to sit on were set up on the flight deck, and as we approached sunset, that's where the crew would sit. Up one deck on the missile deck area, all the support forces that were on board the ship, FBI, NCIS, Mobile Diving Salvage Unit 2, Norfolk Naval Shipyard, crew members from other ships, Fifth Fleet staff all standing up there, our chaplain who had flown aboard the ship who had been operating in the Mediterranean now with the George Washington, got up as we approached sunset and gave the invocation. I spoke, then a crew member from every rank that we'd lost spoke. Officer, Chief Petty Officer, enlisted. And as a crew, we sang Amazing Grace. Chaplain gave the benediction, and at sunset, we lowered the flag and folded it and had 17 sailors lined up on the starboard side of the ship. And as we took that folded flag, now our battle ensign, and passed it from sailor to sailor, we paused, rang the ship's bell twice, announced the name of the shipmate that we'd lost, and rendered that last final salute. When it got to the end, my command master chief, the senior enlisted on board, came and presented it to me, and several months later, I get, turned that flag over to my relief, and when he rebuilt USS Cole, that flag is now mounted on the mess decks of that ship. But trust me, I'm keeping an eye out. We could wake up in the middle of the night, see that flag proudly flying at the back end of the ship and know who we were and what we were doing to defend freedom. And every morning we'd wake up and we'd see that flag flying over the ship and know that we were going to get that ship back home to defend freedom by being rebuilt again. But trust me, I'm keeping an eye on it. Cole's going to finish serving our nation. That flag's going to come off. It's going to go into a museum because it's part of our naval heritage. It's part of our nation's history. Before 9-11, there was 1012. Today I've had the honor and privilege of not only sharing the story of my heroes, but also giving you the tools for that foundation. God bless each and every one of you here at the NTSB. You go out there every day doing God's work to keep the public safe. Keep up the great work, and thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for the opportunity. It was very, very gracious of you. I'm humbled. Absolutely, I'd love to. Questions are always the fun part. Nothing is off limits. And guess what? I'm not on active duty anymore, so I don't have to be politically correct. We're not sitting at a university, so I don't believe in the non-attribution policy. If I say it, I'll stick to it and back it up with facts. And the last thing is, 
please, this is your opportunity. You can ask about the event. You can ask about leadership. You can ask about current national security issues. So all those fun things going on. And don't make me be the professor, though, and start pointing around the room to get a question here and there. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you for your service. Thanks. Thank you. Um, at the beginning of your speech, you said that all the enlisted personnel were taking the ship out when you first, I don't know the right nomenclature, sorry. Underway. Um, underway, thank you. And that it served a purpose when you were attacked because they were ready, willing, and able to take over. If the coal had not been attacked, what would have been the trigger for those enlisted men to rise to that level? I think that we, anything that would have happened on board, the crew would have been able to stand up to because I pushed my crew probably harder than most commanding officers. And if nothing had happened, I probably would have walked off and just been looked at as a real hard nose that really pushed them to go above and beyond what was required of them. But in a defining moment, that isn't what happened. Why I was put in the, on that ship with that crew, pushed and trained to that level, we'll never know why. But the fact is, when it did happen, the crew had that confidence to be able to step up. And I think one of the things that has happened over time Something that you here at the NTSB have dealt with is when you look at the recent Fitzgerald and McCain collisions, we're obviously dealing with the ramifications coming out from that. And it's a whole series of things. When I built the Navy's first Arleigh Burke class destroyer, we were manned at 315 people. The morning I got hit on USS Cole, we were a little over 290 people. Fitzgerald and McCain forward deployed forces were steaming around undermanned, undertrained, and under-equipped with only about 250 personnel aboard the ship. They literally don't have the time anymore to have that level of training that I was able to invest in my crew, which is why I believe we're in a period of vulnerability right now. So I think that in many cases, we have to look at and start being a little more honest and saying, what does it take? You know, and I'll be honest with you, I'm gonna give you the flip side of the coin. 4,000 ships fought World War II to victory with 100 admirals. Height of the Reagan buildup stared down the Soviet Union to victory with 125 admirals. The dam down to 280 ships, and I have over 400 admirals and SESs running the Navy. So what's wrong with that picture? That's part of the challenge that we're facing is people have gotten content with a bureaucracy driving military needs rather than actual strategy driving where and when we should deploy them with what. But my crew, I can't focus on that big picture stuff. Now I get to. Then. This is my ship. I've been given a responsibility with a $1 billion national asset, and we're going to go sail in harm's way. And this crew and this ship will be ready. And I think it paid off. Thank you. That was touching as well. Uh, definitely thank you for your service. You um, came away with some lesson learned. Um, you, were t you talked about why were those um, vulnerabilities there? You weren't sure which ones, and then you found out. And that's kind of what National Transportation Safety Board does. It finds the safety aspect sometimes after the catastrophe. So could you enlighten us about what changed as a result of the lessons that were learned from this particular incident? Absolutely, it's a great question. When you look at the lessons learned coming out of USS Cole, it fundamentally changed how we operate. When I pulled in, for example, when I was in the Mediterranean, that is when I had to submit my force protection plan. So I knew I was going into what was then called threat condition Bravo port, okay? That was number two of four, four you know, delta being the highest, which is attack is imminent, alpha being the lowest. So when I went in, I had about 63 force protection measures to follow. Being a good lean forward guy, I said, I'm gonna do all 63 measures. That plan was approved all the way through the chain of command. What I didn't know is that when I pulled in and I'm gonna peer out in the middle of the harbor, half the security measures didn't even apply to my geographic circumstances, yet the chain of command above me knew where I was going to be moored. 
So what was happening, force protection plans that were being submitted then were just being rubber stamped and approved, like, yeah, it was a check in the block kind of thing. Now they actually take the time for every one of those measures, and they take a hard look at them and say, okay, for every force protection measure that's out there, what are the procedures that they have to follow? What is the equipment that they have to use? What is the training we have to give them to use those procedures and use that equipment? What are the rules of engagement, and will they allow us to do that particular step? And what's the driver for all of it? Intelligence. Do we have it, and why? And if not, why not? And begin to ask the hard question, why? And if we're overseas, and a host nation is taking care of force protection measures, are they trained to the same level that we are? So it fundamentally changed how we're going to be doing business. When we go into ports now, that thing has had a very thorough scrub, and commanding officers at times have said, I've got these unanswered questions, and guess what? I'm the accountable officer. I'm not pulling my ship in until these are answered. Now, they can be ordered in, and a commanding officer can still refuse. They may get fired, but by the same token, if the chain of command can't answer the hard questions, then you know, people are going to really start looking and wondering what's going on. So I think that in reality, that was one area that changed. Another one was in damage control and medical. There were a number of things we didn't have on board. We didn't have defibrillators aboard the ship when we got hit, for example. They are now installed. The coveralls that the sailors wear today with the number of pockets, the thickness of them, the leather gloves they use, the various equipment on board the ship. We no longer, when I got hit, we didn't have any sat portable satellite communications off the ship. Now we do have that, so that in the event you do lose total power on board the ship, you have an ability to pick up a phone, whether it's Iridium or a portable satellite communications, and be able to get word off the ship to communicate with higher authority to let them know what's going on. So in a number of ways, the ripple effect of the lessons learned fundamentally changed. But what's also happened? That ripple effect went out, all those changes got implemented. Here we are 18 and a half years later, Familiarity with not another attack having happened, guess what happens? Well, let's start cutting back on the budget. Let's start studying back on the equipment again. Let's start cutting back on the training again. Let's start cutting back on the oversight again. And it's slowly creeping inward. And I think that McCain and Fitzgerald are really culminating events that the Navy said, we can't afford to have forces operating at sea the way they are with nothing happening without understanding the reasons why. So there's been a lot of lessons learned even that come today. Unfortunately, let's face it, you're in a business where the best lessons learned come out of tragedy in how to do things right because people aren't proactive sometimes and you're merely the investigators in all of it. It's other, other elements in our government that actually make decisions on certifications or otherwise that can clearly have an impact on how you do your job eventually. Good afternoon and thank you for your service. Uh, my question is, you mentioned that one of the engineers was the last time you saw him. Is yes. that the same person who had the leg? No. The, the last person I saw, my main propulsion assistant, he would, he would be killed instantly in the blast when it hit. The one with the leg over his shoulder, Senior Chief Lawrenson, he would survive. He would promote to a Master Chief. He honored me by asking to come do his retirement ceremony. I actually went to his hometown of Elk River, Minnesota to do it. This is how dedicated I am to my crew, and why he picked to do that ceremony in January is beyond me. <laughs> but it gets cold in Elk River, Minnesota in January. Sir, I had the opportunity to have lunch with the Marine folks and you, and you brought up the, the concept of authority and responsibility and blame. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. When you look at that, what happened on board that ship, I, I make the argument, I don't even have to make the argument. There was one accountable officer on board that ship that morning, and that was me as the captain, period. But there is a fundamental difference between accountability, responsibility, and blame. When you look at accountability, I was the one accountable officer that morning. When you look at responsibility, that's a bearded guy that we shot in the face in Abbottabad, Pakistan, stuffed into a body bag with 100 pounds of weight, and he's now at the bottom of the Indian Ocean. If you want blame, that's with two suicide bombers that took a boat, blew up against the side of my ship, killing my sailors. So a lot of times you'll have people that want to blame me for having created the circumstance that allowed that attack to occur despite what the investigation says. That's saying I'm no better than al-Qaeda terrorists. 
you can expect I'm gonna push back on that a little bit. So kind of understanding how that differentiation works. As the accountable officer, the only thing I asked was, do the investigation, just like you do. Families deserve to have hard questions asked of everybody involved in an incident like that. I don't care how uncomfortable it is. As the accountable officer, I never gave a media interview. Why? That investigation needed to run its course. And at the end, if they found me to be contributory in some way to that, that attack having happened, then guess what? I get held accountable at that point. But they looked at that total sum of all those force protection measures and everything else, and at the end, an investigative team, far senior to me, endorsed all the way up through the Secretary of Defense would determine there was nothing that I could have done or not done along with my crew that would have mitigated or prevented that attack. I will always live with the fact that 17 satyrs died on my watch. But don't ever say that I was to blame for having allowed that attack to occur. So that's how I would define it. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, yes, sir. Um, Commander Lippold will be around, I think, for for uh, extra questions if you if you like. Um, so you know, at the beginning, we looked at a slide: the five five pillars of leadership: integrity, vision. That's to make sure that everyone knows where they are going, and what work they need to do to get there. Personal responsibility and accountability. Trust and, and invest. That's to allow them, the workers, to, to innovate and allow them the opportunity to fail. If we keep a protective bubble around everybody all the time, they don't have that opportunity to fail. So uh, that's how we learn. Yes, sir. Professional competence lay out the standards early on uh, in performance reviews. Don't wait until the performance review to say what you didn't do right. Lay out, clearly lay out the expectations on the front end and then hold people accountable. You know, you, um, I want to give credit to Drew Eilers uh, for getting Commander Lippold here. Uh, Drew, uh, a number of years later, was the commanding officer aboard the, the coal and uh, he reached out to you and you agreed to come. Absolutely, sir. Well, we had also had an opportunity to meet at an event. That's at, uh, right, we did in Mar March, of, March of last year. Exactly right. Um, you were going to come, but we had this thing called the government <laughs> shutdown. Um, just a minor issue yeah, that kind exactly. of disrupts things occasionally around here. So um, he's a member of a speaker's bureau and, uh, and I suspect has paid handsomely for his fees and speaker's bureaus don't like it when their speakers go out and don't charge a fee. But you did agree to do that for us because of who we are. And I really appreciate your leadership and the message that you are spreading. And I particularly appreciate your doing us the favor of coming here to spread that leadership. Mr. Chairman, it, it, this truly is an honor because yes, while I may go out and do speeches on leadership as a way to make a living, I also know that I, because of the uniqueness of this event, it is also an opportunity for me to give back to my nation. And for those that are out there working today, day in, day out, 365 days a year, in order to keep our nation safe, and you are at the forefront of that activity. We are a great agency, and uh, you know we've had to, uh, over the last few years, we've enjoyed speakers, and I've tried to have a constant theme uh, throughout these uh, leadership series or speaker series to talk about various aspects of leadership. You've certainly given us, given us a graduate course on that. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Th Chairman. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Mike, I want to thank you also for for handling it. I had the, the privilege of spending uh, uh, three hours at uh, Congress today uh, for congressional testimony. So, Mike, thanks for running with it. And we've got just a little uh, something for appreciation here. Oh and uh, let's see let's see how nice this thing looks. It's uh, absolutely beautiful. Let me, I'll pull it yeah, out. Yeah. That makes it a little... I don't dare, though, because I've got to hold it by the tip and the bottom so I don't get fingerprints all over the we, glass. We can take care of the fingerprints. So. <laughs> but uh, thank you. Well, that's thank truly you. an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll do another one soon, but uh, thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. I just can't thank you. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure.